In chapter 12, we're going to be talking about circles, and the first part of a circle we will talk about is the tangent line. The tangent line is a line that touches a circle exactly once, so it doesn't pass inside of the circle. So if I want to look at a tangent line, I might uh, try to draw a line here. Notice that right now this line is crossing the circle twice. I want to move this so it's touching exactly once, which would be about there. Or if I come back, it's no longer, it's now touching twice. So if we look at the angle that it's forming, uh, is it's going to be at a 90 degree angle where I'm only touching once. And so we can define that tangent line as the line that is perpendicular to the radius of the circle, and then that will always be a 90 degree angle there. We can also talk about the point of tangency as being the point where it actually touches the circle. One way we might see tangent lines in real life would be where we're swinging something around us in the shape of a circle. Now the direction that this thing wants to go is always straight out along the tangent line. So wherever you let go of this, even though this person might be looking out towards B, if he lets go here at B, the object is going to continue on a path along the tangent line. So in an event like the hammer toss, if this athlete wants to throw this hammer out in this direction, she needs to let go of that when she's actually facing over in this direction because the object will continue along the tangent line. So our first theorem is just dealing with if it's going to be touching exactly one place, we get a perpendicular here. And so when we have the perpendicular to a radius, we know we have the tangent line, or if we have a tangent line that's perpendicular to something passing in a circle, we know it's the radius. One way we can use this then would be a problem like this. We're asked to find the measure of angle x. If these are the radii and this, these are tangent lines, we know that these have to be 90 degree angles. Since we have a quadrilateral formed here, we know that those angles add up to 360 degrees. And so I have 117, I have uh, 90 in two different places, and then I have my x. And so I know that those add up to 297, giving me an x equals 63. We can also use this in a problem where we want to find the horizon. So we, if we have a sphere here like the Earth, if we're at the top of the tower, we want to know how far we can see to the horizon. Because we would, the horizon would be the tangent line because it's going to be where this touches exactly once. So we would be looking at the distance to here. Now looking at this image over here, notice that I would have the radius of the Earth is 6,400 kilometers, 6,400 kilometers, and it's going to be in two places. Since this is a 90 degree angle here where this forms with the radius of the Earth, I can use a right triangle to solve this where the distance to my horizon, I could call that D, would be the same as taking this 6,400 and then coming up. Since this is above the Earth, I'll have that 6,400 plus this little bit extra. Now, this isn't going to be very much, so this isn't to scale, but since this is 0.45 kilometers, this whole side, I would just add that together. And then I would use the Pythagorean theorem to find my distance d. So my d squared plus, so this is my right angle here, so 6400 squared plus my hypotenuse squared. But notice I would need to add those sides, those parts together to get the whole side. And then that will work out. I'm going to round that to the nearest kilometer, which would be 76 kilometers. Again, that would tell me how far it is from the top of the tower to where we see the horizon. This theorem is just the opposite of that. It's saying if we're touching the circle and we know that we're perpendicular to that radius, then it has to be a tangent line. So if we know we have a right angle to a tangent line, then we also know that this is a radius. So if we want to find the radius here, which would be x, and this is drawn in two different places, we could do that by setting up an equation. Now notice that this side here would be x plus 8. So when I'm using my Pythagorean theorem, I'll use my legs, x squared plus 12 squared. But that's going to be equal to this whole side, x plus 8 squared. That means we'll have to multiply this side out using FOIL. And simplifying the equation, notice that the x squareds are going to cancel out. And I can move my 64 over to the other side to get x alone which is going to give me 80 is equal to 16x, or x equals 5. We were asked to find the radius, and the radius is x, so we'll say radius equals 5. In this example, they're asking if it's the tangent line. We have numbers, but we don't know if this is a right angle. 
So if we're going to check, then it should fit the Pythagorean theorem. So the question we should be asking is, is a squared plus b squared equal to c squared? Because if the answer is yes, it will be. So we look, the legs would have to be the two shorter sides, so 7 squared plus 24 squared, and then the hypotenuse would be the 25 squared. This is going to give me 625, and this is also going to give me 625. So we see that they're equal, which means a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So the answer is yes, this is a tangent line. Because that right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem, is telling us that we have a right angle here, making that a tangent. Okay, the next theorem looks at if we have two tangents coming together and meeting at a point, then those two tangents should be congruent to each other. So I can see that in this one I've got a couple of tangent lines, and if I bring this down, notice that distance from A to C and the distance from B to C are the same, no matter where I go. It could be on either side of that circle. Now, this is also going to be true if I have a few tangent lines, they're all meeting. In this case, I'm making a circle. Notice those two orange ones are the same, the two green ones are the same, the two blue ones. So we can use that in some of these problems to find missing parts here. We'll look at it a little bit. Well, what's most important is this would be congruent, these would be congruent, and these parts would be congruent. So it's the points going to the same corner that would work. We can have other shapes circumscribed, which would make those two parts the same, these two parts the same. But be careful because this one isn't actually circumscribed because we have this extra space, so that's not going to work for this one. In this one, they tell us that we are inscribed in the triangle, the circle is inscribed, and they want to know about the perimeter of this. Well, notice we have a lot of parts missing. We've only got the 8 from here to here, but we don't have this length. Well, those would be the same because this is the same. These are tangents meeting in the same point. Same thing with the 15. It would match this over here, so this side would be 15. The 10 over here would match this part over here, giving us another 10. So if we want to find the perimeter, we're going to just add all of those parts together. I have two 10s. I have two 15s. And we have two 8s adding up to 66 centimeters, and that would be our perimeter. On the bottom, notice these two circles, and first if we look at the larger circle with R, we would see that these two are the same. If we look at the smaller circle with Q, we would notice that these two are tangents, so they are the same. Since those two are the same, those two are the same, that means all three of these tangents, whenever we have intersecting circles and we're sharing tangent lines, then the parts are going to be equal to each other. And so I can take this 6x plus 5 and set it equal to negative 2x plus 37. Remove the 2x to get 8x. I can subtract 5 to get 32, giving me x is equal to 4.